And last week, I preached the message, what it looks like when God is in control. Now, that was the beginning of a series. And today, it's where the Spirit of the Lord is. So this is part two in the series. And what my heart here, and if you're on the video uh, watching later, that you in your church, as we are, will begin to again move in the works of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus did. He said, these things shall you do and greater. Where's my friend Ron? You, you, you be nice and loud sometimes. And uh, the people on the video, I've had people say, who's that Ron fellow you keep on talking about? And so we began this with what had dropped into my heart. And that was the verse of scripture from Exodus. And this will, this will uh, prevail through this entire series of messages. I'm praying that it will for the rest of the year and beyond. That you in your family, in your heart, in your mind, in this assembly, this is the gathering of God's people. And the gathering of God's people, I believe, should take note of this in Exodus 25, verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, what does a sanctuary look like? Well, to me, I see a garden. I love gardens. I'm terrible at growing gardens, but I am very good at appreciating gardens. And of course, you don't want to have weeds in the garden, do you? Weeds don't make gardens look any better. They make them look worse, and weeds are not good, and so you want to get rid of those weeds. Whatever those weeds are, you want to consider and let them make me a sanctuary. Let them make me a garden. It was the garden of Eden that Adam and Eve were to tend. This would be their sanctuary. And that was to go around the whole world. And when the Hebrew people were going to the promised land, they were to make that promised land a place that would be running with milk and honey. And so God established the church that we might also build within our hearts a place where God not only resides today, but that we would make this a sanctuary in my mind, in my heart. It's very difficult to go off sinning and thinking terrible thoughts when your intention is to build and make God a sanctuary. Would you agree with that? I think it's difficult to do a, a horrible thing when your intention is to do a very, very good thing thing. Now, the beginning of this series and right the way through, we're going to be exploring the moving of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I believe every one of us will experience and see, and many people will see things for the first time. I'm looking to a God of miracles I'm looking to a God that transforms lives. And I believe that, particularly today, as I set the platform for this, that each and every one of you will understand that there is a place of power in the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus called it dunamis power, dynamite power. And when you look at a lot of Christians that look like they're the walking wounded, it looks like they, were, they got blown up by something in their life, hurts in their life. Whereas they should have been an influence of power in the Holy Spirit, they were influenced by something else that pulled them down. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power. Who knows who's speaking right here? It's Jesus. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Not in you, upon you. There would be a, a, a transforming work of the Holy Spirit separate to salvation. You see, the thief on the cross could be saved. He had no time. He would never have any time to attend a church service. He would never have time to, 
to go on a missionary journey. But in that moment, he received Christ. To as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And so here, there is that born again experience, more than an experience, life-changing work within us, and we are saved. And names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But Je and Jesus is speaking to people here that are saved. And yet he's introducing them now to something that only the prophets in the Old Testament had experienced. And he's saying, these things shall you do in greater. You think you've seen it before? You're going to be part of it. And he says, you shall receive dunamis power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Jesus was bringing them into the idea and the notion that he would duplicate themselves in them, and that this gospel would spread around the whole world. You imagine standing there with the disciples. They had no idea what he was talking about. They had, well, images... They had the Old Testament prophets to refer to and they'd had three years where Jesus did a whole lot of amazing acts of miracles and healings. But me? Who's ever gone to God, or God, God, gone to God and said, really? Me? I'm not even worthy. Anybody thought like that? that you know, you did it, Jesus. Natasha over there, she's spiritual, she might do it, but me, really? I've thought that way. And Jesus didn't discriminate against people. In fact, I was saying to someone this week, you know, he, he was saying to me, oh, I'm really a pretty bad sinner. And I said, and that qualifies you for salvation. What qualifies you is when you come to God humbly and say, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. You see, he doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And so whoever you are, you're watching this, what we're ministering today and going forward is for you. Can you just agree with that? It's going to be for you. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? Looking at... Across here, I think everybody that I know has. The work of the Holy Spirit, we believe, is active in the life of the believer. In five ways. Number one, he is the agent of regeneration. Number two, he is the helper foretold by Christ, who leads believers into truth and maturity. Number three, he is the, uh, as the one who believe, uh, as the one who believers are baptized into, to be Christ's witnesses. Number four, as the giver of spiritual gifts, and I'll be talking to you about that today, as the sanctifier, who brings believers into repentance and transformation to increasingly reflect Christ. There are people here that have spiritual gifts from God and I don't think some of you might even be aware of it. I was sitting down with John and Barbara the other day. We had a wonderful time together. It wasn't long enough. And John started to share with me some experiences that he's had of praying for people and I was able to qualify and identify that that man has a gift of healings upon his life, which I'll be talking to you about today and going forward. We have a man in our, in our church that has literally a gift of healings upon his life. Healings is deliberate. And so this is where we are headed, making that sanctuary. And so... As we explore how to build a sanctuary for God amongst us 
and move in the power of the Holy Spirit, we will then be able to answer this question in time. And that is, would it matter to the local community if the church folded today? Would it matter? Now, right here, right now, I don't really think the, the community would be bothered at all if the church closed down. And I want to address that. Because I think if you're walking down the street in the miracle working power of the Holy Spirit, I think the local community will start to wake up and see, as they did with Jesus, that it really does matter. And it really does matter that we love our community. It really does matter, as they did in Acts chapter 2. The local community started to become very fond and loved what God was doing in the disciples and into all of these new folks. 3,000 people in one day gave their life to Jesus. And it began to matter. My, I want us to be able to answer that question coming up soon. And I'll ask you again as we go through this series. Does it matter? And I'm hoping we'll be able to say, yes, we can see by the response. People will respond, I love tennis. And I happen to know that if you, if you hit a tennis ball against a wall, it's going to come back at you. If we start giving out the love of God, the, the gifts of God, the miracle working power of God, and we start helping our community in ways where they need help, I think they're going to, that's going to bounce back to us in a very positive way. Do you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Well, 1 Corinthians says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, as a pastor, I, 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 I can rev it up. I can rev up a message. Uh, I've been a speaker at various different large corporations where I can get the crowd jumping. But as the pastor of an assembly of a local church, what's more important to me is that you have two things, safety and security. That's more important to me than anything, truly. And this is where I believe the church, particularly the Pentecostal church, for which those on the recording should know we would consider ourselves a Pentecostal church. However, I think Pentecostalism has gone into areas that it just ought not to have gone, where it's become man power instead of God power. Can you see that? Have you looked? Have you noticed? And so I'm wanting us to move in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the power of me, but the power of you, because if it's God, it'll last. And if it's not God, it'll fail. So before we go into exploring the gifts, you can imagine as a teacher, preacher, it's important for me to lay a platform. I'll never forget getting my license that I failed twice. Got it on the third go. That that driving in, that uh, fella, the, the test fella, he um, went to the driving instructor and I'd had 10 lessons and uh, failed once, then I failed twice and he walked over to the fellow who was uh, teaching me how to drive. And he said, uh, this fellow doesn't know the fundamentals of driving. You want to go and teach him those fundamentals before you bring him back here. And so I found this. You see, I believe that when you receive a gift, you also re receive with that a responsibility. Now, if you're given a dog or a cat or a car or a house or a piece of jewellery or a computer, whatever that might be, and someone gives you that as a gift, don't you think you're now responsible to look after that gift? And you see, it's my opinion, looking back over the last 50 years, I don't like saying that. Edit that out of the video. <laughs> But looking back over, I could say the 60 years, but I haven't been a Christian that long. But looking back over the last 50 years, I can say, I believe 
many Christians have mishandled and not appreciated the gift that God trusted them with. And they were not responsible. They did not behave responsibly. And I can see that churches have got caught up in the excitement of the gift rather than who the gift is from. And so it's important for me to lay a foundation of character. We've often said in the past, uh, in the past don't confuse the gift with character because sometimes God will give peace and a wonderful gift, they'll move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but their character is not that good. That's actually not how it should be. I don't actually see God giving gifts to people necessarily that have a bad character. I think God gives gifts to people who now are responsible to grow in their character and in their nature. You see, I would say to my dear brother John, who has a gift of healings upon his life, there's no doubt about that in my mind, that you do, brother. Uh, now, di did you impress God enough to receive that? No. Did, did, what, what happened? Well, would I be right, John, in saying that you had a desire in that direction? Yeah? Okay. You had a desire in that direction. God had placed a desire within you. And you have spent much time in prayer, much time reading your word, much time developing your character, meaning this, I can trust you. And so can the assembly trust you for when you pray for them. But unfortunately, typical men, we men do cause a lot of problems. Sorry, none of the women said amen. Well, thank you. We men do cause a lot of problems. We suddenly get a gift from God and we feel like Superman. Here we go. And we neglect that it's all about God, not about me. So men, you're watching, God trusts you with one of his gifts, as we'll look at in a moment, whether it's miracles, healing, or prophecy, or wisdom, or discernment, whatever that might be. And this is, we are not covering in the early part of this message, or this series, we're not covering the fivefold ministry gifts. We've already done that before. We are not covering the motivational gifts, right? of serving and helps, etc. We're not covering those. We're going to be covering the nine gifts of the outpouring given to those disciples in the early church that has prevailed through to this day from Corinthians. So we're going to be unpacking that. Before we unpack that, I want to assist you to understand how to handle it so we don't mess it up. Is that okay? Okay. I don't want to mess it up. How many churches have the blessing of God has turned out to be a curse because pride got a hold of the people? No different to Samson. Remember Samson? God endowed him with great strength. But that guy just couldn't stop chasing women. He just couldn't stop I know there's a few things us men would say to a guy like that. We can't say it here in church. But at the end of the day, that fellow's nature and who he was got the better of him. Time and time and time again. The Bible says in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, For everyone to whom much is given, do you desire spiritual gifts? Do you desire wisdom, prophecy, words of knowledge, discerning of spirits, gifts of faith and gifts of miracles, gifts of healing? Do you desire that here in this church and in your family and in your life? Well, I would say too much is given. Much from him, much will be required. And it's the much that be, will be required that so many people have fallen short of. God has given unto you a gift of salvation. Are you working it out with fear and trembling? God has given to you a gift of the local church. Are you attending? Are you partaking? Are you part of it? God might have given you the gift of marriage and, and it is a gift. And all the men said yes and amen and all the women went oh me. But nonetheless, it's a beautiful gift. What about those of you who are single, who are able to do things that married people are unable to do? It's a gift. Are you using it? Too much is given, much is required. 
and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask for more. And so it's important for me in my heart to lay a platform for us to understand how to live up to God's expectation. A gift is not earned. It is received. But from that moment forward, you are responsible for it. So let's have a look at some of these gifts. 1 Corinthians 12. Let me just read it out. There are diversities of gifts. And this is important before we go any further. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. If you are neglecting the work of the Holy Spirit, you will find it very difficult to walk in God. Because the Holy Spirit's with us. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for myself or for the profit of all. So when God trusts you, I believe the great economy, the great currency of the kingdom of heaven is trust. You see, I'm going to love you for all I'm worth, but if you don't trust me, you'll never receive it. And one of the challenges of the church in Australia is apparently in Australia, 80% of people believe that there is a God. They just have lost faith in the church. So how can we make a place that is a tabernacle where people can trust and be able to say, that's a church that I can receive. When they say they love me, I believe them. When they pray for me, I'm prepared for them to lay hands on me. If they want me to walk in obedience to God, I understand they're doing it because they love me. So this goes on to say to another, uh, for the profit of all, for to one is given the word of wisdom. Now you might already have wisdom, but there can be a word of wisdom. It's a gift. To one, to another, uh, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith. This is where, as I'll give you an example in a moment, where you already have faith as a gift from God. The applications of faith are different in the Bible. Uh, you see, where faith can mean believing. Where faith is receiving. And in this case, this is where I just don't have enough believing for the situation that's in front of me, and yet God, super, through supernaturally, gives me that which I need for the moment. Whether it be for me or for you. And so he goes on to say, to another knowledge, to another faith, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one as He wills. As He wills. Wouldn't you want to be part of a church that's operating in all these gifts? Now, for it to matter to the community, I think we need to be. For it to matter for you and I, I think we need to be. And that's where we're going. But I want to lay this platform with you so that we manage well the gift that God would give us. There are nine uh, gifts there mentioned. Wisdom through the same Spirit. Word, word, uh, word of knowledge. Faith by the same Spirit. Gifts. Uh, this was remarkable. I was telling John and Barbara about this uh, just the other day. A fellow a dear friend of mine by the name of Bernie Wheeler. Uh, he was living in a high-rise building in Broadbeach on the Gold Coast. And, and I knew them well and... They were very loved by our church. And uh, I had shared this story before, so just live with it if you've heard it before. And he looked down out of, I think it was a three-story, he was on the third level. He looked down as a child floating in the swimming pool. Well, he immediately, he didn't even think about staring, he immediately started to run down those stairs to save that child. 
But as he was running, the thought occurred to him of what it could be, what it could look like. And that is, this child might be dead. And as he considered that, hope rose within him that the child would not be dead. And he would have got the child just in the nick of time. But he couldn't help but think to himself, if this child has drowned, I do not have enough faith to believe. I just, that would be too much for me. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the pastor. I'm not someone that has any miracle working power in me. I don't know what to do if that's the case. Well, it didn't take very long before he got to the swimming pool and he dived in, grabbed that child, dragged that child out of the pool and the child was dead. And so overwhelmed with grief, he screamed out, Oh, dear God, dear God, no. Dear God, no. Jesus. And right there he proclaimed, he said this, I was there in the church service when he said it. Right there he supernaturally had the faith to believe that this child would live again. He did not know CPR. He did no mouth to mouth. He didn't know cardiac massage. He just said, what, what, he didn't even know the child's name. He just said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, come alive. And the child coughed up the water and came alive. It was a gift of faith, a gift of miracles poured out in for that moment. Isn't that the sort of gifts you'd like? Wouldn't you like to be attending a church with those sort of gifts happening? Sort of church I want to attend, sort of church I have attended. But you can imagine that sort of fellow now would be susceptible to great pride if he was not careful. Well, praise God, Bernie never suffered pride. And Bernie went on to often operate in the gifts of wisdom and knowledge. And I could share with you many stories of that man and others where I too have worked in the gifts of healings and also the gifts of words of knowledge and wisdom for people. And if you call me and I do not know the answer and I can have no experience what you have, perhaps when you're telling me the story, you can be sure of this, I'll be asking God for a gift of wisdom right there and then. Because where I fall short, his power begins. Can you just agree with that? Just receive that. This is where we are headed. First Corinthians, to lay this even more for us, is to understand in chapter 13, verse 1, For though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass clanging cymbal. You know, friends, that's the other challenge. In the body of Christ is sometimes we have focused so much on the gift. We have elevated the gift and we have forgotten the person. If you do not love one another, all these gifts that I share with you will be pointless. If you love one another, creating a sanctuary for God, then this is where God's power will remain. And there is a place where people come to where they grieve the Holy Spirit, stifle the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'll have a brief chat about that in momentarily. And it can happen where things are going really well for you, but then you will develop an attitude or a resentment or something will happen and you literally stifle the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and then you wonder and you say this prayer, God, where did you go? And he will say, I didn't go anywhere. You grieved my Holy Spirit. You stifled the work of God. Come to me now. Get that right and let me move through you again because I happen to know the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Once he begins to work with you that way, he will not take it away. And that is where the challenge of every Christian is. You see, if we're going to build a sanctuary for God that others can trust, we need to also explore what God requires of us. And the basis by which we can be trusted. How many here, if you had a little baby, would just give your baby to anybody to look after? 
I mean, these days, even baby, you know, services, babysitting services, you've you got to check them out before you even ring them up to look after your children. Now, God loves you and God wants to work in you. And you ask for a gift and God will, be, God, God will give you the desire of your heart. But you want to be a person that can be trusted. Many a person operating the gifts have also had to receive the discipline of the local church. And so we want to be a people that desire these gifts, but can be trusted with that and the people, which is why I share with the musicians. They, I believe they led very well today and I love them. And that's a gift to the body of Christ. But it is one where it is, a, it is an elevated position, one where they should be understand that we trust you and you need to be that person of trust, which is why we're not going to just let anybody join the musos. Let them be a person that has shown some nature, good character, people of good report before they start leading the body of Christ into praise and worship. And of course it's happened in the churches where if you've got a gift, well, you just get on up there. Now hang on, have you got a character to back up that gift? Okay. So the basis by which we can be trusted. Before we can ask, we, before we ask an array of other questions, which no doubt we shall do, we need to ask this question. And I hope, I hope what you'll do is get these messages that I'm ministering on and share them with others. Make them go viral, not for my sake, but for people's sake, for your sake. The first element, the first principle, I believe, of trust is a person of honour. A person that understands honour. Honour may not be respect, but it looks like it. You see, I may not have voted for the Prime Minister of our nation. I'm not telling you whether I did or didn't. I'll tell you privately. And so I may not respect him. In fact, I can say, and I will say, many of their policies, in fact, not only do I disrespect, I, I am disgusted with. And so you probably got an idea I didn't vote for him. So there you go, I fessed up. Having said that, do I respect the man? No. No, I don't. Nor his behaviour. If he came to my front door, would I honour him? Yes, I would. Because the first place of honour is to honour God and his commandment upon me to honour those who rule over you. So honour might not be respect, but it looks like it. Do you get that? You honour your mother and father. They might be disrespectful people. You might say, honour my mother and father. Do you understand what they do? Uh-huh. I do. And you don't respect them, do you? No, I don't, because they haven't earned it. They've been awful parents. Okay, honour them anyway. Why? Because God said to. And honour will look like respect, even if you don't respect them. Do you get that, church? And so we are to be a people of honour. There is so much of honour, and I will not spend more than this message on honour. I might refer to it a few times through this series. But if you are not a person of honour, I want to make it very clear to you, God will not honour you. And you have prayed. And you have said, oh dear God, cattle on a thousand hills. And God has said, you are dishonourable. But if you are a person of honour, God will honour you. You see, a person of honour, when having a conversation with someone, and you know what it's like, you, the person asks you a question and you don't want to offend them. And so do you lie? Well, you might not exactly tell the truth either because you don't want to hurt them. And so you tell what the world might call a white lie. 
But in so doing, you have dishonored God. So the first place of honor is the truth. A truthful person is more likely to, to be honorable than that person that is not truthful. Can you receive that? And so you will be challenged. Well, I don't want to hurt that person's feelings. And God says, do you honor me or them first? Oh, I honor you first. Well, honor them by telling them the truth. Oh, but it's going to hurt their feelings. Uh-huh. Do you honor me or them first? Okay, okay, I honor you first. Well, honor them now by telling the truth. You see, an honorable person will recognize authority. One of the challenges throughout the body of Christ has been troublemakers. People that just don't get what they want. People that just get ticked off with the pastor. Have I ever been ticked off with my pastor as I grew up? Yes. Yes. A number of times. And do you know what I did about it? I went to him once and, in fact, I knocked on his front door. I drove, I, went, I didn't drive over there, I didn't live very far, so I walked down there and knocked on his door and he opened the door and my eyes were full of tears. And I said to him, I've talked about you in a negative way. I want you to know that I love you. I am sorry. He said, what was it? I said, it doesn't matter what it was. What matters is that I love you. I am sorry. Will you forgive me? And he said, sure. <laughs> to me, it was such a big deal. He had no idea. Later on, as he called me up to work in the ministry, it was circumstances like that, where he said, Chris, I can trust you. Because he had seen me fall and seen me rise. He'd seen a bad attitude in me and he saw me correct it. I became a person of honour. And that's what the sort of church that I want us to be. They will recognise authority both inside the church and outside the church. You know those names you call the police? Stop doing it. <laughs> They're police. <laughs> a couple of people have mouthed a couple of words they say. I've noticed. Don't call them that anymore. The Bible says... <laughs> to be to that a church must honor widows we must honor widows the bible says also in second timothy chapter 2 verse 20 do you know why we're doing this do you have any idea why we're talking about this right now this is laying a platform for a church that will know how to manage the gifts of the holy spirit as god begins to pour them out upon us and the first place has to be honour. It has to be. Second Timothy 2 verse 20, But in a great house there are vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some of honour and some of dishonour. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of, for honour, what's it say? Sanctified and useful. For the master, prepared for every good work. What's the opposite of useful? Useless. If you are not a person of honour and you are running around or operating the gifts, you are pretty much a pain and useless because what you're doing will be burned up in the fire. What you want to do is be a person that says, Dear God, I want to work in miracles. I want to work in healings. I want to work in prophecy. I want to work in the gift of tongues. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, have your way in my life. And God says, Now, are you a person of honour that I can trust in my house? And if you are, then you will be useful, not use. <laughs> I wouldn't want to call anybody useless, but it is what it is. My mother called me useless a couple of... Anyway, we'll move on. Second Peter chapter 2, <laughs> verse 17. Now, what's it say here? Honour who? Nah, honour all people. I'm not going to honour everybody. Why would I want to honour everybody? Some people are disgraceful. Some people... Well, am I going to be a Christian 
I, I put a post up on Facebook the other week, the other day, and it was, when you're in doubt of what to do, the first place to start is what would a Christian do or behave like a Christian. Can you believe it? Somebody took me to task over that. Really? And I responded privately and I said, the post was to behave like a Christian. You're not behaving like one. Let us behave like Christians. What is, what is honour? Is honour respect? Not necessarily, but it looks like it. So that when people come into our house, into our church, they will feel safe and secure. What if they got tattoos all over their face? They will feel safe and secure. What if they've gone and had a sex change already? They will feel safe and secure here. What if they've been divorced five, six, seven times? They've got three ma- weddings, you know, three, ma- three marriages, one come and one go and one stay. Uh, what sort of people are we going to be? What happens when a prostitute walks into our place, into our house, into our church? Are we going to be a people of honour? You might not respect what everybody does, but God says, honour all people because I want to move through you. I want to love you. I want to work in you. I want you to be like my son Jesus to do these things and greater. Be trusted with the gifts. Can you say amen? Amen. Honour all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God and honour the king. But what if I don't respect him? Didn't say that. Honour him. Pray for him. Pray for our Prime Minister. What does honour look like? It looks like telling the truth. Honour looks like, you know, in fact, I was asked the other day why I always wear long sleeve shirts when I'm preaching or teaching. And it was just something I decided in Bible college because I was considering this word honour. And in Bible college, I decided that I'd be one of those preachers that dressed up for the office of pastor because I wanted to honour my congregation. Now, if you came to my place later today, you'll see me, it looks pretty ghastly because it's been so cold, wearing thongs, and in America a thong is flip-flops, all right, not the other one, right? Wearing thongs with socks. (laughs) Yeah, seriously, right, seriously, right? With socks. And I have a pair of tracks, trackies that have got holes in them. But I love that pair of, pair of tracks, those, those pants. I just love them. I've had them for years. They've probably got mould on them, but I'll still wear them. I don't care. I like wearing them. They're comfy. Right? And then I, I have a, a T-shirt like I have on today. Then I'll put a jumper on that. It's been really, really cold. So I wear another jumper that I've had for over 20 years. It's, got, it's made of wool and it's got bits hanging off it. Now I'll wear that at home. But when I come to see you, I visit you in the house of God. I'm not going to look like that for your sake. Not for mine, but for your sake. And for, for his sake to honour the house of God. Can you receive that? Yeah. So... I'd prefer to have turned up looking like I did first thing this morning. It's just that I don't think we'd be... I mean, as I've said, you know, the concept here is to grow a church, not to scare people away. You see, a person of honour will fulfil God's command to honour their parents. In First Peter, for those who honour me... What's he say? It's up on the screen. I will honour. Wow. What's it say? First Samuel. Sorry. Thank you, church. Did I say First Timothy? I don't know what I'm saying. First Samuel. There you go. Chapter 2, verse 30. For those who honour me, what's it say? I will honour. For those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. In other words, you won't get much from me, says the Lord. 
<laughs> I won't be, won't be using you very much. But you're a person of honour. You see, a person of honour doesn't uh, recognise they make mistakes. But the way they respond is from honour. Now, symptoms of a dishonourable person. Symptoms of a dishonourable person. I've only got four written down here, but there are others. Number one, pride. Pride always gets in the road. And they quench the moving of the Holy Spirit. They quench the moving of the Holy Spirit through their own pride. Whether it be in a church. They're always better than you. They're the sort of person, they'll listen to you, waiting for you to stop talking so they can start telling you all about themselves. Oh yeah, I've done that. I love it when people say to me, I'll preach a message. And they subtly say, that was a good reminder. So you knew that all along? Oh, no. Well, why did you say it was just a good reminder? Oh, and it might have been a good reminder. It might have been. But sometimes people say it from pride. You can't teach me anything. All you can do is remind me what I already know. How long have you been with Jesus? 24 hours. Oh, okay, well, you must know it all then. Number two, they suffer from broken relationships with people. It's just the story of their life. And we all have broken relationships sometimes, don't we? But this sort of person, they are dishonourable and you don't want to be around them and neither do I because you can't trust them. Can you trust a dishonourable person emotionally with your secrets? No. No. You can't. You tell that person a secret where you trust them with your heart they're just going to go and abuse you, friend. They're a dishonourable person. Number three, it is rarely their fault. I, I like watching senates, you know, when the, or they'll, they'll uh, have somebody come in to give a testimony as to what they've done. And it just seems I'm hearing these words a lot. I do not recall. We have a photograph of you doing this. I don't recall. That's probably a doctored photo. Really? Are you telling me that video wasn't real? Yes, they've made that. Really? What's it? AI, is it? You see, this sort of person, it's never their fault. And number four, the one that really ticks me off the most is they're critical and they're never satisfied with you or me. No matter what we say to you, I remember when we started this church, Ah, oh, it was for the first 12 months, people that had attended other churches here locally would stand up the back with their arms folded just looking at me like this. Boy, it's uncomfortable when people do that to you. And, and I remember many people coming just to check me out and this church out. And, and I would walk up to them and I'd say, you know, th there's probably some other churches you might want to check out. <laughs> With a big smile on my face, thinking, please don't stay. Please. Because I can't, you're a dishonourable person. How can we build a sanctuary for God that he may dwell in? Well, we build a house where when people turn up here, they see Jesus. And this is why, and if Julie comes forward, would you play that? You, you know, we sang that song, The Spirit of the Lord is Upon Me. That, that's about 40, 50 years old, and I love it. You took me right back. That's why we needed to sing it again. Just play it in the background. As I read this out and you contemplate this message, are you a dishonourable person sometimes? Are you, honorable? are you seeking God? Have you stifled the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Have you stifled the moving of God? Are you that person through your own inadequacy? You know, you can be honest about it, you know, because a, an honourable person will say, yes, I was, but I was wrong. Oh, Lord, forgive me. You don't need to do it twice. 
once is enough. And God will help you through. You see, here's what I see in the New Testament. Acts 4 verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter, there's something about honorable people. They become bold. Boldness is a fruit of being honorable. Of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled. They realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. That we might have guests come into our church and they will see people come here and they will say, I knew that fella. We used to play two up down at the club and he'd get drunk all the time and and he was into gambling and boozing and sleeping around. What's he doing in your church? And we could say, well, we were honorable and we just loved on that fella. He's a Christian now. No, really? Yeah. Wow. How did that happen? Well, it happened where, you know, Sandra went up to him and said, I have a word from the Lord for you. And Roz went up and said, I just feel that God wants to touch your heart right now. What? Why did you talk like that? Well, this is a church that believes in the dunamis power of God. And we receive words from God and we can pray for you too. And in fact, I can pray for you, but we've also got people here with gifts of miracles and healings. Wow, do you? Yeah. Wow. Well, I I need a healing here. Well, I can pray for you now, but I'm going to call John over because he's got a gift of healing. So, John, could you pray for that person? John, and do you know what? Do you know what? And seeing the man that that had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Who can say anything against a culture and a sanctuary where God abides? Would you just receive that message today?